Last time, uh, I gave you an assignment where I gave you a, both a line, and the line was y equals negative 2x, but then also a parabola. Parabola is y equals 1 quarter x squared. And my question was, I gave you several different points, and my question was, how do we figure out which one of these points is the closest point to this line, or the closest point to the parabola? Um, and the, one, the points that I gave you, I didn't choose particularly smartly. I probably could have chosen them better, because it was really easy um, when you just plotted those points on the axes. One of them was like right here. Uh, and so you could immediately say, oh, that must be the closest one. But I wanted to focus on the process. How do we decide? What is the nature of this problem where we ask, which of these points is the closest? Um, so I want to begin by just asking your teams what you came up with for your write-up. So what did you say was the nature of this problem and the nature of its solution? So what kinds of things did you write? Um, basically, especially when, or this one was a little different, but mostly for the parabola, you find the derivative and then you um, do optimization formulas. Okay. So you find the derivative. What do you do with that derivative? Um, really so let me back up a step here. Um, so what are you finding the derivative of? I agree that this is an optimization problem, the problem of finding the closest point on the line to something else. But what are you finding a derivative of here? The line to, like, the main line. OK. So here, this main line was the line y equals negative 2x. And the derivative of that would be minus 2. What did you do with that minus 2? Because see, I don't think it's that main line that we're taking the derivative of here. Uh, remember, every optimization problem is an attempt to find either the maximal value or the minimal value of some quantity. But what is the quantity that we're trying to maximize or minimize in a problem like this? Uh, the line that's perpendicular. Ah, OK. So we're trying to minimize. We can't really minimize a line. But what we can minimize is the distance along a line between one of these points that we're interested in and the line that we're measuring the distance to. And depending on which point that we choose on that line, we're going to get different distances. So let's suppose that I pick a point like, I don't know, right here. Let's say that the coordinate of the point that I pick is x. And so the coordinates of the point right here on this line would be what? If the x-coordinate is called x, then what are the coordinates here? Yeah, so this is going to be f of x, where y equals f of x is the function whose graph is that line, right? But if the line is y equals minus 2x, then the coordinates of that point, the x-coordinate is what we called x, but the y-coordinate is related to x by the equation y equals minus 2x. So x comma minus 2x might be a point chosen at random along this line. Um, and then meanwhile, I have an actual point out here that I'm interested in. This particular one has a coordinate 7 comma 4. And so what is it that I'm trying to optimize? What is it that I'm finding the minimum value or the maximum value of? The distance, specifically the distance from whatever point it is that I'm interested in, 7, 4 in this example, to any point on this line. And every point on this line can have the form x comma minus 2x, so we're just going to call it that. So then what we would do is we would set up a function that tells me what that distance is. Well, how do we do that? If I want to know what the distance, or rather, let's call it the length. If I want to know what the length of this blue line segment is, how do I find it? The square root of x squared plus minus 2x squared. Square root of, so here's what Greg says. Agreement, modifications, what do you think? Yeah, we're going to need something that also tells us something about this 7 over here, right? We can't forget that we're, we're not measuring the distance to the origin. That's what you've done here. Oh, yeah. We're measuring the distance to the point 7, 4. So, as Heather said, 
Um, what we really need is we need to subtract the x-coordinates to find the run, subtract the y-coordinates to find the rise, and it's the rise squared and the run squared that we then add and take the square root of. Um, so pictorially, what we've done is we need to measure that horizontal distance, which would be 7 minus x. That picture is getting a little cluttered already. And then this vertical distance, what would this vertical distance be? Four minus, minus 2x. negative two x, yeah. And we can take the liberty of just making that four plus two x. And so the distance, the relevant length here, is using the Pythagorean theorem on this right triangle that probably could look a little bit more like a right triangle. Here, let me just put that there. <laughs> So this is a right triangle. We're finding the length of its hypotenuse. That's why the distance formula in Euclidean geometry works the way that it does. We just have the square root of 7 minus x squared plus 4 minus negative 2x squared. And that becomes what we call the objective function in our optimization problem. We need to find where that quantity achieves its minimum value. If we find the x value at which that achieves its minimum value, then that should be the point on this line which is closest to 7 comma 4. So we can approach it as a calculus problem, um, but that's a little bit limiting because any time that we can substitute doing tricky calculus for doing something simpler, uh, it's probably a good thing to do. So the goal of today is going to be to figure out whether we can substitute for that calculus problem a simpler problem in linear algebra. After all, what we're doing is we're finding the closest point on this straight line to 7 comma 4, and that closest point is going to occur along another straight line segment. So it doesn't seem like there's a lot of kind of nonlinear behavior going on here that would necessitate the use of calculus. This really feels like a linear problem. So by the end of our class today, we want to figure out if there's a quick and dirty linear algebra solution to how to do this. And wouldn't it be nice if there were just a quick formula, the application of which can give you a matrix, a linear transformation which if we just apply that matrix to the, the vector 7, 4, immediately we get our closest point. That's where we hope to be by the time we wrap up today. So that's kind of the description of the problem. Did any group sort of explore what they thought the nature of the solution would be? And what I mean there is, did you think about whether this closest point always exists and whether or not if this closest point exists, is it necessarily unique? These are the two big questions of higher mathematics, existence and uniqueness. So what do you think? Yeah. There will always be a solution. It's not necessarily unique. Always exists, but not necessarily unique. Any group want to either support that or challenge it? Provided that the set is not empty. Ah, OK. All right. So which of these do we need to make sure that the set is not empty for? OK. So let me take Brian's amendment here. Always exists if the set S onto which we're trying to project is not the empty set. Anyone else have any other suggestions on modifications or challenges? behind the not necessarily unique assertion? Under what circumstances might the closest point not be unique? Um, if you have a, a parabola and then have the point right in the middle, you have uh -huh. two solutions. Okay, you could possibly have two solutions, such as the example from video 1A, right, where here we've got a parabola and a point which is kind of directly above the vertex of the parabola. Um, again, kind of in the video, what I'm doing is kind of making the argument that we're going to find the closest point uh, to this parabola. This parabola is the y equals 1 fourth x squared, and this point is 0 comma 4. We can find the closest point by just looking at points which lie along a circle centered at 0, 4, and then expanding the radius of that circle until it just touches the parabola. At that instant, the points at which the circle touches the parabola will, by definition, be the closest points to 0, 4. Um, so if we do that, kind of slide the radius of the circle out until it just barely touches its tangent to the parabola at that point. Um, then we do, in fact, in this example at least, get that this circle touches the parabola kind of twice simultaneously. So here's an example where the closest point is actually 
two different closest points. So that's interesting. I think we can also take some solace in the fact that something we learned about the line was also true about the parabola. Take a look at the nice perpendicularity here in between the parabola and the line segment, which joins these closest points to the point zero 04. Um, so something is clearly still the same about this problem, but the uniqueness has gone away. Right? Um, we may not necessarily have a unique solution if we're not dealing with straight line, if we're dealing with something else. Um, and linear algebra, I think, is not going to help us here uh, to project this, because this is a, not a linear thing that we're projecting onto. Yeah. I had a question about that. So also, the point zero, 0 would be perpendicular to the point. That's so. true. And that could also be, um, if we think again about this as an optimization problem, if we set up the distance formula in this example, and I don't want to do all of it out, but um, we could picture picking a point x comma one-fourth x squared, one-fourth x squared, and then measuring the distance to 0, 4. Um, this distance is going to be, if you call it d, of x, the square root of x minus 0 squared plus one-quarter x squared minus 4 squared. <coughs> All of that underneath the square root. And you could imagine trying to find the minimal value of this function d of x. And if we graphed it, here's what I would suspect would happen. Gosh, I'm going to have to think about this for a second. Um, so we're going to end up with a minimum value, and then kind of another critical point, and then another minimum value. This is how I would expect that distance function to look. So we end up with these two points, which are the closest, but then we also have this other critical point at the origin, at 0, 0. But not every critical point is a minimum. Right? We could have critical points that are maximum. We can have critical points that are saddle points. Right? Um, so we may end up with extra critical points in this example as well because of this extra nonlinear behavior that's happening. So one of the big questions of today is, if we are allowed to throw out the example of parabolas and anything that's kind of crazy and nonlinear like this, if we are allowed to just go back to the safety of straight lines, then can we guarantee the solution will always be unique? And the second question is, you answered the existence question in the affirmative, but need that always be true? Can there be a case where there is actually no closest point to a given point off of the set? Um, so those are a couple of the big questions to tackle today before we think about the linear algebra side of things. Right, so the, the observation is that what mattered most about this line as far as locating its closest point was really its slope and not its y-intercept. So if I had a bunch of other lines that were also parallel to this original line, then this same line segment which connected this point to its closest point on, on the original line would also, that same segment, connect to the closest points on these parallel lines as well. And again, that's because what matters most seems to be this right angle. So one of the big questions of our first four weeks uh, of the semester is the nature of that relationship between minimizing distance, finding the, the shortest distance to something, and perpendicularity or orthogonality. What do those have to do with one another? And is that relationship more general than what we're seeing in the special case of just looking at Euclidean geometry in the xy plane? It's a classic leading question because, of course, the answer will be yes. Um, but what we're going to do this semester is push that. Um, and see how it can apply to a whole lot of different scenarios, not just Euclidean geometry in the plane. So in the videos, we also looked at uh, projection as a linear algebra question. And the sense in which we did that was as follows. I want to think, again, same projection problem that we just looked at. We have the set, which consists of the points where y is equal to minus 2x, so the set of x, y in R2 such that y equals minus 2x. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to see this as a linear algebra problem. In other words, I wanted to find a matrix or a linear transformation, the effect of which is to project some point onto this line. And let's take again the point 7, 4 that we were looking at a minute ago. In a perfect world, 
I would find some friendly matrix such that if I applied that matrix, I'm going to call it P today, if I apply that matrix to the point 7, 4, I'm going to get this closest point. Right? P is going to take 7, 4 and produce for me that closest point on the line uh, to 7, 4. And the way that I started doing that, if you watched the videos, was to think about finding a matrix whose column space is equal to S. So how does that work? How do I find a matrix whose column space is exactly equal to this line, y equals minus 2x? What was the trick? Yeah. Uh, matrix negative 2, 1. Negative 2, 1, I think that might be a little backwards, but so where does that, where does that matrix come from? Of? Okay, so that's close. Um, it's what we would call kind of the dual of the answer that I'm looking for in the following sense. So thinking about what column space means from linear algebra, here comes the throwback. What does column space mean? What, what do we mean when we say the column space of the matrix? It's the number of non-free variables gives you the rank of a matrix. Okay, the rank is a number. The column okay. space is a set. What set is it? The set containing all the long bands. Yeah, so here I'm going to use a loaded word from linear algebra. I'm going to use the word span. Okay. So the column space of a matrix, I'm going to think about it in two different ways. First of all, we call it column space because it is, by its very definition, the span of the columns of A. In other words, it's the set that's made up of all linear combinations of the columns of A. All linear combinations. That's what the word span means, all linear combinations of the columns of A. Right. Um, and so that means that if I have a vector inside of this set S, maybe I can find such a vector by just selecting any point along this line, like negative 1, 2. So I can pick a value for x and then figure out what value y would take. So I find some vector um, which lies inside of my set S. Then how do I write down a matrix such that the set of all linear combinations of its columns is the same thing as the set of all multiples of negative 1, 2? What matrix can I write that accomplishes that? What did I do in the video? Yeah, this one is, it, it, I, I'm making out the question to be something complicated, but the solution is quite immediate. If I want a matrix such that the set of all of its columns linear combinations, in other words, the span of all of its columns, is the same as the set S, then I should just choose, one of the easiest ways to do it is just choose as the column this vector from S. Because then, the set of all linear combinations of the columns of this matrix, in other words, the span of the vector negative 1, 2, what is this? This is the set of all vectors that we get by multiplying negative 1, 2 by a constant and then letting that constant range over all real numbers. But if we do that, what we're really getting I just multiply this out here, negative C1, 2, C1. We're getting the set of all vectors inside of R2 whose second coordinate is negative 2 times the first coordinate. So it's the same as the line y equals minus 2x. So the process of finding a matrix whose column space is equal to a given subset is a process of nothing more than choosing vectors inside of that space and then making those vectors the columns of our matrix. Question? Um, 
Exactly. So this is not a unique process either. If I, instead of the vector that I chose, if I chose this one, instead of negative 1, 2, maybe I chose 1, negative 2, then my minus sign would move. And my matrix will be different, but the column space of that matrix remains the same, right? The, the, the columns of this matrix still span the set S, the line Y equals negative 2X. I don't think we're going to get to it today, but we can do the same thing in higher dimensions as well. If I'm in three dimensions and I have a plane that I want to find, a, a matrix for which that column space is equal to the plane, um, we just have to choose two vectors in the case of a plane um, and then make those vectors the columns of the matrix. Today's goal is as follows. If I try to, so thinking of a, of a matrix as representing a linear transformation, this linear transformation is coming from the real numbers, R, because we only have one column in this matrix. If I'm going to multiply this matrix by a vector, that vector has got to have only one entry in it. There's no way for me to multiply using matrix multiplication this matrix by something which has more than one row. It's not going to happen. So this transformation has to come from the real numbers and land inside of the xy plane. So it goes from R into R2. The problem, of course, is that any x that I pick back here in the real numbers, if I multiply this matrix by that x, I'm going to get a point, ax, which lies along this line. I cannot, in particular, get the point 7, 4. So if I call this point B, then the main theme of our first exploration here is that I cannot solve the equation AX equals B. That equation has no solution for the reason that any AX, any X that I choose, AX is going to be along this red line. B is outside of the red line. So we can't solve the equation AX equals B. It's not solvable. But, and this continues to fascinate me. It's one of the reasons I love this subject. Even though I can't solve this equation, if I multiply both sides of this equation by something, and the something that we have to multiply it by is the transpose of A. Remember, the transpose is where you exchange the rows of the matrix with the columns instead. So if A was 1, negative 2, then A transpose would also be 1, negative 2, just written as a row instead of a column. Even though we can't solve the equation on the left, it turns out that we can solve the equation on the right. And by solving the equation on the right, what we'll find out is that we actually get the closest point to B when we solve that equation. 